best way to get any institution to grow. Because once people are empowered and they trust you, uh, then they can even do extra work without being told. I also appreciate the concept of integrity. As they say, um, ability can take you to the top, but it is character that help you to remain there. Meaning that when you have integrity, you are inclined to do the right thing even when people are not watching. And that's very important, both in personal life, but also in business life. Stop it. Yes. And then play. Okay, leave those ones. <laughs> I have talked about the vision. I have talked about integrity. I have talked about courage. But, I also, uh, but there is also accountability to be able to accept uh, responsibility for what you do. Objectivity to treat people um, equally. So, and that comes from the concept of equity, which goes far beyond sameness. Okay, next. I'm now going to talk about uh, to, to, to try and place the University of Namibia into it its educational context. And that's partly because uh, UNAM does not function into a vacuum. It is part and parcel of society, the Namibian society. Uh, it is part of the African community and it is part of the international community. Uh, in Namibia, in relation to Namibia, sorry, can you, okay. mm -hmm. <laughs> in relation to Namibia, we try to think globally and act locally. And this is a very important policy statement which gives us guidance as to how we should look at the position of UNAM within the Namibian educational context. I quote, as we develop our own new ideas and technologies, we become less dependent on important innovations and the conditions that often accompany them, as it helps us become more successful in setting and pursuing our own goals. Education is liberating, both individually and socially, meaning that Namibia is also aspiring to innovate and find solution to their own problems. In terms of Africa also, Africa also follow the same spirit. As the statement from 
the Continental Education Strategy for Africa, CESA, which is actually an African Union body, it says that quality education is imperative if Africa is to attain this vision, generate homegrown solutions to challenges um, successfully in influence, and the challenges that successfully influence the growth of the economy. And not only that, Africa is calling up, uh, upon us to take the issue of poverty seriously because that's a, ma a major problem uh, in our societies. The international community too also believe um, in the role of higher education in social transformation. Education can actually change society. It can direct uh, the, the way or the direction that any society can take. Paul Vadis, where is UNAM going? Does UNAM have a role to play in Namibia's higher education system? And how can UNAM contribute to these efforts? That's the question. Next. If you look at the general aims of education, this is what most of us believe that a higher education or a university is supposed to do. To do. Teaching, teaching uh, is not just about um, providing knowledge, but it is also about developing culture. And by culture, I'm not talking about tradition. I'm talking about the total way of being of either an individual of, of society. And it is also important for an institution like UNAM to ensure that it promotes ethical and aesthetic values. We need, when you as a staff of UNAM, people must see that this is UNAM staff. If you are a student, <laughs> a UNAM student. People must see that this is a UNAM student. That's what it's all about. Research has got a great de developmental function because when you create, we create knowledge that can bring about change, that can help us actually uh, to develop society. You remember, for example, the research that was done by Professor Kiremire, who found a chemical compound that could actually, uh, I mean, attack malaria, sleeping disease, and all that. That's what research can do. It can bring about change. Community engagement. A university or an institution of higher learning is supposed to lead the way. It's supposed to be exemplary. And that's why we must work on our advisory service. And as a university, it is also important that UNAM serve as a catalyst for promoting democratic ethos and social justice within society. And that UNAM can do by being exemplary in the way we conduct business. Next. Now I will touch briefly on, the, on UNAM's um, socioeconomic context. Vision 20, uh, 
um, both Vision 2030, in short, both Vision 2030, uh, NDP4 and NDP5 emphasize the importance of uh, reducing poverty. Next. Next. And the Harambe Prosperity Plan actually goes a step further by talking about alleviating poverty. It also talks about effective governance, economic advancement, Social progression is really the area that we as an educational institution can make a difference. The, the University of Namibia has got a great vision to be a beacon of excellence in innovation, in teaching, research, and extension services. It has got great core values, but the question is, are these values, for example, part and parcel of each one of us? That, because that's very important. There is no point to have good values on paper, but they are not being um, useful to the university community. So that's why it is important for, for staff and students alike to internalize these great values. What is then is my vision. My vision is UNAM's vision. I would, however, like to add in the spirit that to be a beacon of excellence in innovation, in teaching, research, and extension services in the spirit of equity and social justice, because it is those two that can lead us towards social transformation. My, st my strategy for UNAM's sustainable growth. We are living in an era where everybody is talking about lack of money. And that's really a great problem. And UNAM is not spared from that problem. And that's why my very first uh, strategy is to review our expanding administrative structure. And that I think it is important in order to create a balance between need and want. We might want something, we want nice things, but we might not be able to afford it. So we need to look at our ever-expanding administrative structures. But how, how do I, I get to uh, my strategies? To be able to come up with some strategies, you need to at least do some SWOT analysis, looking at the uh, institutions, uh, objectives, its vision, mission, strategies, and everything else. UNAM has got, as, as I did a SWOT analysis, I realized that UNAM has got established governance structure. 
We have fairly good uh, national and international image as well. It's not that bad. We have a strong academic quality assurance policy based on, on the National Council for Higher Education and the National Quality uh, Standards. And more importantly, we have available a functioning student welfare system. Am I not right? UNAM is also a, a, a culturally diverse community in terms of both students and staff. We have people from all over the world, be it uh, staff, uh, 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 those who are coming to assist in one way or another, or be it students uh, from different countries coming to study here. The faculties and centers normally have got ways of working together. There are no tough wars, wars in, at UNAM. Not that much. Yeah. Hmm. We have national and international partnerships and linkages with leading higher education institutions and laboratories. And we have also a transparent student admission process. We have a capacity building program, but the question is, how efficient is it? I'll come to that, I'll return to that point later. Pardon? Only? Okay, okay, then um, go ahead. Okay, yeah, continue. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah, some of the challenges that we have, for example, are inadequate funding. I've talked about that. We, we, we risk losing some prominent faculty uh, because of, uh, for various reasons. Um, and there is a decreasing ability to compete for and retain top class faculty and staff. Um, we have lack of business incubator, for example, that can nature student entrepreneurship. And, and there is a disadvantage in attracting lucrative donor funded research. Okay. Okay. But when all is done, UNAM, despite all challenges, unfortunately I have a few minutes, UNAM is still the premier university in Namibia. Yeah. If the annual university ranking at the African and global level is something to go by, UNAM has proven itself as the premier university in Namibia. Established only 26 years ago, it has this year, 2018, scooped the 104th spot out of 1,493 higher education institutions in Africa. <laughs> UNAM is also this year number 3,448 um, out of 27,000 524 institutions in the world. We could still do better than that. I'm therefore proud to have served UNAM for a cumulative 14 years, and thereby having made a humble contribution to its growth, and by consequence, Namibia's socioeconomic development. Even more so, I am delighted to have an opportunity to compete 
for the top leadership position of our esteemed institution. I believe I have what it takes to take UNAM forward. In, in conclusion, as a transformational leader, I do believe in leadership. Like Nelson Mandela said, I learned that courage was not the absence of fear, but the triumph, triumph over it. The brave man is not he who does not feel afraid, but he who conquers the fear. I believe in courage. In conclusion, Will's ability may take somebody to the top. It is character that makes the difference in people's lives and that of the institution. Academic skills and competence may not be enough. A transformational leader, trans uh, transformation leader understands that leadership is not about title yes, yes. and authority, <laughs> but serving people and community ought to take precedence. To move the university forward to, uh, towards sustainable growth, therefore entails that providing top level academic leadership for the development of relevant policies and processes that attract and boost research funding for the university. Championing campus community engagement and interaction, understanding the university's strategic and action plans, increase industry learning experience through attachment and internship to improve em employability of UNAM guidance. As Dr. Nkwame Nkrumah said, countrymen, the task ahead is great indeed and heavy is the responsibility. And yet it is a noble and glorious challenge, a challenge which calls for the courage to dream, the courage, courage to believe, the courage to dare, the courage to do, the courage to envision, the courage to fight, the courage to work, the courage to achieve. Thanks, Prof. Time, time, time. There is no security on this earth there is only opportunity. UNAM has opportunity to se secure the future and contribute Colleagues. meaningfully to the socioeconomic development of Namibia and humanity. I offer myself as the next vice chancellor to lead. Prof. You are lead, out of time. To lead this noble institution <laughs> to greater height for the good of our country and humanity at large. I thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We will now, um, we will now take questions for our good professor. And this time again, I will move from the front to the back. Three rounds of three questions each. I need to have my timer with me. All right. Okay, can you move this? Alumni coordinator. Good afternoon, Prof. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm this side. Oh, okay. oh yeah. Um, good afternoon, Prof. Good afternoon. My name is Kashiwanwa. I'm an alumna of the University of Namibia. I have just, just that one question. I'll possibly say I was looking at the SWOT analysis. I don't happen to see any alumni mentioned there in terms of a strength. Um, Maybe you can convince me otherwise, but I believe the greatest strength of this university is the alumni. And then, you know, this, the management of the university, out of the seven, we have only one female. 
I'd like to get your view on the basis of what, what's your views on um, the uh, female empowerment, you know, the gender, um, should we do more as a university? And may I just take this moment then to say um, I'm completely inspired that for the first time ever, we have a candidate for the vice chancellor, a female candidate for vice chancellor of the University of Namibia. Congratulations, Prof. Congratulations. Mr. Nakota, still want my module to be regretted. Eh? Good day, my name is John Nakuta. Elizabeth, I would be very frank. Um, and I would want you to, in a very frank manner, to respond to this question. How would you respond to the view out there that your appointment as the new VC might be a curse rather than a blessing? And why do I say so? One, We've got the sad reality of political patronage in the country. Secondly, we've got this reality of jobs for comrades. And thirdly, we've got your own personal political background that may count against you. So how would you then respond to this? In addition to the challenges economically that you've mentioned, you bring, your appointment brings another additional challenge, and that is being your political background. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, dear friends. Uh, uh, I'm uh, Andre. Just, just a minute, Prof. Sure. Uh, can we please uh, be silent so that we, yeah, thank quiet. You. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Andre Di Pisani. Uh, thank you, Elizabeth. It's, it's wonderful to see you up there. But you spoke about diversity in the university as one of the strengths, and you, you mentioned several strengths, but diversity is one of them. The challenge in university is not just managing diversity, but using it as a foundation for building um, a culture of learning and building a metropolitan culture that can transcend the divisions amongst the diversity. How will you do that? Prof, you may attend to these three questions. Okay. So the question from my sister there is, um, uh, yes, you are right, but before, before I... What happened to the mic? Okay. Okay. <laughs> The question from my sister there about alumni. Yes, I do agree with you that alumni, alumni it is important there because we, are always, we always appreciate, uh, or we ought to appreciate, I mean, um, for example, utilizing skills of those we produce ourselves. And we have done so, there are quite a number of people in leadership whom I, I have taught and who are uh, doing a fantastic job. So alumni is, is important. On the, gender on the gender issue, yeah, that's, there's always, um, the way I see it, um, a difference between what people say and what they do. Yeah, everybody sings the song of gender equality. But when you look at the practice, uh, women are still being disadvantaged. And that applies also even to UNAM. So therefore, we still have a lot to do in order to ensure that this gender issue uh, remains on the agenda for a long time to come until it is resolved. And if I take over, I will make it one of the important issues. <laughs> Appointment of a VCS, it is a case because it comes at a time when UNAM is undergoing some dif difficulties. 
uh, including financial difficulties. So whoever is going to take over has to be prepared. And out there in, in society, yes, a jobs for comrades is not only out there in society. Even in, at UNAM, there is some practice. And on my political background, let me tell you that uh, before, uh, let me tell you that our constitution guarantee freedom of association. And all of us need to read the constitution and understand. So we cannot prevent people from making whatever choices they want. So therefore, um, uh, the political aspect must be looked at within that context, number one. And number two, I was a member of SWAPO for 24 years. And I jumped out for five years for specific reasons that I pronounce very clearly. But then within those bef uh, five years, I realized that po party politics is actually similar, whether you are in Swapo or in another party. And therefore, <laughs> because party politics is just something else. I am an academic because I spend more time in academia than in, pol in politics, actually. I spent only five years in politics. So therefore, you need to look at me for the qualities that I possess and not for other things that you, you are bringing in. <laughs> the issue of diversity. I'm one person who have got a strong international experience. And I do believe that diversity does enhance um, our way of doing things. Because as we interact with one another, then we, we also learn from each other. So that's one aspect, diversity, that we need to nature uh, within UNAM as well, because it's very, very important. Thank you. We shall move on to the second round. Uh, Kalola, you had a chance. Let me start here. Uh, afternoon, Professor. My name is Eba. I'm a graduate student uh, in Bachelor of Art, Clinical Psychology. Uh, basically, there is an issue with University of Namibia system and Healthy Professional Council of Namibia system. Uh, the Healthy Professional Council of Namibia does not recognize uh, a clinical psychology students as health professionals, meaning that they don't register, they cannot register us, uh, and we don't have um, privilege to internship in Namibia, nor we can practice as psychological counselor, not even under supervision. So not only that we are in the street with our certificate, but we just do not have a way through because we cannot practice without our license. So my question is, what are your smart collaboration as uh, Professor uh, Gideon suggested? Will you use or utilize with healthy professional cancer to solve this issue that you are having? Thank you. Oshili. Yes. Colleagues. Second question, second round. Yes, go ahead, please. Afternoon, Prof. Uh, my name is Tuafeni Kalola, SRC President. I know this question suits you. Um, coming from the education background, in the country itself, we have uh, the shortage of qualified teachers. So how do you plan to do this? OK. Yeah. No, sorry, just just give. Qualified teachers. In the country? Yes. Uh, uh, Prof, did you get that question? I certainly did not. 
Oh, maybe we, I can. Are, are you talking about qualified or unqualified? What is the question? I'm saying that in the country itself, mm -hmm. is the mic working? Yes. Okay. <laughs> so we have the shortage of qualified teachers. I know we have a lot of teachers, but majority of them are unqualified. Okay. Do you understand me now? So coming from the educational background, how are you going to do that? Okay, just give to the lady in front of you, and that will be the third question in that round. Yes. Um, good afternoon. I would just first of all like to congratulate the professor in front of us. Uh, I, I, am, I, I speak for the women empowerment. And um, I have a very specific question when it comes to the, girls, uh, the girl child. Um, in view of your vision and your goals that you just presented to us, UNAM this year had about or more than 60% of um, enrolled, uh, enrollment was girls. I would just like to find out how would you ensure as the vice chancellor that the girl child is encouraged to excel in, in, spite, in spite of many um, social economic challenges and to make sure that they are at parity when they enter the job market, and especially when it comes to male-dominated industries. Thank you. Uh, Prof, you may attend to these three questions. Okay, I'm not so sure we're there. I'm, I'm, not a, a health, uh, I'm not a health person, so I'm not sure whether I understand the question, but um, that's an issue that uh, one need to look into uh, by maybe, um, uh, but but maybe carrying out some some kind of um, applied research in order to understand what's going on and help our students who are on the street. Because there's no point for for us to invest in students uh, just just to prepare them for the streets. But at the same time, as a university, um, or, or maybe I can say that education is not just about getting skills in order to get a job. Education is also about uh, preparing people and, and developing um, critical uh, capacity uh, so that uh, and and uh, so that people are able to take initiative and 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 be able to think out of the box so that even when they end up being unemployed that they can do something else so we must rather also emphasize that point then we can help more people than just um, say everybody searching for a job Um, the shortage of qualified teachers. Uh, that's partly the reason why the colleges were, were, were actually added to UNAM, so that we can improve the quality of teacher education in the country. And as you know, um, the pre-primary teachers, for example, they, they were complete, many of them were completely untrained. But now, because uh, the, the Faculty of Education has developed a, a Bachelor of Education um, in, uh, in, in pre-primary uh, in, in pre education, so, and that will help actually to, to produce more um, uh, qualified pre-primary primary teachers. We are now training everybody actually from pre-primary up to secondary education level. So uh, UNAM is doing something right at least. Uh, the issue of the girl child. I'm a gender sensitive personality and gender is not just about women, it's about men and women. So what I have notice is that as we invest a lot in the, gray, in, the, in the girl child, I have seen, I see some improvement that 
When you look at the people graduating, for example, at UNAM, 60 to 70 percent are women and only maybe 30 percent are men. Why is that? So because these efforts we have been making, they, they, they are bearing fruit. So we need also to consider the male child so that we can bring them at par. Okay, it's your turn. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Prof, for your presentation. I just have one question for you. Uh, you said that you are a transformational leader, uh, which implies that you are an agent of change. Now, I wanted to understand in a few lines, two or three lines, what is your blueprint to change or transform the status quo of you now? Thank you. Okay, pass, pass the mic. And... Uh, I will go to the good professor there, my sister there, and then move there. Normally in my church, this is where the elders uh, put in a song in the middle. <laughs> but it's okay. It's a serious business. <laughs> Prof, let me start with the student leaders. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Elizabeth and I'm the speaker of the student parliament. Um, so my question to you, Prof, is um, we have about 12 campuses and as student leaders and also um, the entire university at large, we are faced with an issue of um, decentralization of power and also resources. How are you going to make sure that um, Katima campus or Henty's Bay campus is not left out um, if you are to be appointed as our new VC? Thank you. Sorry, they are not left out in terms of what? They are not left out in terms of decentralization of power and resources. Thank you. Prof? Uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, my name is John Mfuni. I'm in the Department of Biological Sciences. Uh, my question relates to the, the current situation where some of our graduates that we have uh, produced are not employed, which suggests that perhaps they we are, are not employed, mm -hmm. which may suggest that they are, we are overproducing. But I'm also aware that uh, the politician would l like to have more students access the university education. Now, in light of this, as our new VC, should you be appointed? What would you do to prioritize so that we have uh, a system that allows us to graduate students that can be employed, but at the same time, balance the pressure from the politician who is saying we want more of our children to come to the University of Namibia? Okay, Prof, you may attend to those three before we go to the last two questions on the side of the wall there. It is unfortunate that uh, I did not manage to show you the, my complete blue, um, all my, uh, my strategies as I, I prepared them because um, of lack of time. Um, but like I said, If I take over as the Vice Chancellor of the University of Namibia, the, the, uh, um, the, the university is in this critical condition where we, for example, depend too much on government funding. And I think the way forward is to find ways of of mobilizing our own resources in order to minimize dependence on uh, government funding. And that is because, um, and, that, and that you can do uh, by developing a strategy to mobilize funds. It is all, uh, you can also do that by strengthening 
research. Uh, but by research, I mean quality research, because when you are coming up or coming out with quality research, then people will be more inclined to support your research uh, programs. So I would, um, for example, um, do something about the research output of the institution so that in such a way that it can actually bring in um, uh, funding in order to improve our finances. And secondly is the issue that I talk about that um, our administrative structure is ever expanding and that uh, we need to take a second look realista uh, realistically in order to create a balance between uh, want and need in terms of uh, financial uh, prudence. And there are many other issues. I mean, um, if I had more time, I would elaborate on that. Okay, the, the issue of uh, the fear of being left out, I don't think that Katima campus would be, uh, I mean, less valuable than the main campus. So um, Katima campus is a UNAM campus. Uh, HP campus is a UNAM campus. And wherever there is a UNAM campus, we need to take care of, I mean, as an institution, we need to take care of, of, of those campuses. So because if they are not productive, because things are not right, then it's also um, take, a, uh, it, that can help, uh, I mean, can lead to taking us down as well. So it is important that all campuses are taken care of. UNAM overproducing, and, 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 what to do, and then um, the politicians who want to have more, um, more students uh, graduating. I think that just goes back to what I said before, that education is not just about giving you some narrow skills in order to do a certain job. Education is much more than that. It, it, it's supposed to produce independent thinkers, people who can take initiatives, people who, can, uh, who, who, who are innovative and come up with uh, new ideas. So, um, so we should not just, I mean, look at the function of education in a narrow sense. We have to look at it, uh, the function of education in a, br a broader perspective, that education is more than just narrow skills. So that's what I would say about that one. So it is, it is good, actually, the more the merrier, if we can have more people uh, having access to education as long as that is the right education that will improve their life in whatever way, in different ways, not just in terms of getting a salary. So that's my view. Thank you, Prof. And lastly, maybe just to, to emphasize the issue of quality. So we need to, to work on sequam so that it can help us also to improve our, the quality of our education. We have one final question. One final question. Um, Prof. Amkua, good afternoon. My name is... I cannot hear. My name is Shirley Shivangulula. Um, thank you for a very interesting presentation. Um, I'm actually intrigued by your take on integrity. Um, I want to understand that that is a character-specific attribute, and in your presentation, you made 
uh, mention of it voluminously. Okay, my question to that is, um, how would you, or maybe what strategies would you put in place and how will you be able to measure integrity as a character specific attribute in your operations should you have the opportunity to sit as the latest vice chancellor of the university? Thank you. Like I tried to mention, the issue of integrity is connected to uh, the development of character. And how do, um, within the university setting, it is actually possible also, I mean, to, you, you, you have seen, I mean, you, you, you know that UNAM has, um, has got, uh, um, uh, have got core values. And our, um, part of that core val values is also integrity also feature there. So um, the way to ensure that um, uh, integrity or ethical behavior and so on, um, I mean, um, are made part of people's culture. And, I, and as I said, I don't look at culture in a narrow sense. I look at culture, the concept of culture in a broader sense, uh, meaning that it is the, your, their total way uh, of life of an individual or groups of individuals within society. So the issue here is, the key issue here is, is to ensure that those values are not just on paper but that those values become an integral part of people's culture, be it the staff, be it the students. And if you can um, manage to do that, then you have won, or you have um, moved a step forward. And that, if I take over, that's one aspect that um, I, I will take care of. And that's partly because I believe in personal growth. And if I take over, I will make sure that there is a program within UNAM that tackle the issue of personal growth so that we don't just concentrate on institutional growth, that we, but we take care of the person as well. I thank you. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, let's put our hands together for our candidates. Thank you, Prof, and good luck. Ladies and gentlemen, you have been a good crowd so far. Just hang in with me for the last hour. I think we can do this together. I don't want you guys to leave me to do this alone with the panel. So please, uh, it's, it's empowering that way. Again, let's stretch. Uh, um, talk to that neighbor. Tell them why you did not apply and what your plans are for your own future. And maybe after six years, we will talk to you here. Is it clicker? And you can only apply when the position becomes vacant. People are wanting to give me CVs already. No, you have to wait for six years. And while you are stretching, I will invite our final candidate so that while their presentation is setting up, you are able to stretch more. Oh.
ladies and gentlemen, that will be Professor Kenneth Matengu. Going to be brief, but a little bit longer, in that I'm going to talk about why I believe I'm the suitable candidate for this job. And then I will, I will outline the UNAM mandate and my response as a VC to that mandate and uh, how the current situation is of the university in the context of the economic challenges. And then I will say what I will do. Uh, and I will conclude with general remarks and give conclusions. Uh, now, who am I? Thank you. Thank you. Just give me time. Thank you. I, I am 40 years old. I come from, um, from Zambezi region. I have a very broad understanding of higher education. I've worked in this university, but also in uh, two universities in Finland. And I am going to be borrowing some of that experience in, t in terms of how I'd carry out the VC role. Uh, I am very much experienced in building partnerships. As some of you know, I have led the international office for six to seven years. And through that, many of the networks that all of us talk about in the university were built and negotiated by me. I, 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 started, I started this uh, in this university uh, as a student, but in my second year, I got an offer to be an intern. And I continued from an intern to a junior researcher, senior, and so on, until I became an associate professor some three, four years ago. And so I have a broad understanding of the issues around whether it is related to students or to academics or in administration, and how that responds to the country's uh, interests. I have also served in the bilateral commissions of Namibia and other countries, and I will be sharing some of the achievements coming out of that. Basically, I subscribed, in terms of leadership, I subscribed to the notion of service or servant leadership and transformation. I am not a boss. I am just one of you entrusted to carry out a responsibility. In terms of uh, qualifications, I believe in self-development. So I'm doing my, what you could call third PhD, because I had a postdoc as well, in higher education management at the University of Bath in England. I already hold a PhD, and many of the qualifications you can see from here, my bachelor is from this university. In terms of honors, I was recently nominated to be an honorary visiting professor at Aberystwyth University in the United Kingdom. I already hold a honorary uh, visiting professor in Cardiff, and uh, I have been an international alumni, uh, the first international alumni of the University of Eastern Finland. The other two who have gotten that are two ministers from Guatemala and uh, from uh, Sweden. And uh, I've, been, I've been a fellow, I've been a fellow at uh, Oxford, uh, and I was very privileged to spend a couple of months there to learn about technology innovation and transfer. Uh, and my PhD was uh, the best in 2006, although it was uh, awarded in 2007, that uh, honor. And I am a co-winner of the International Higher Education Award for International Collaboration uh, in the United Kingdom. In terms of relevant experience, as I indicated, I started uh, as an intern. I rose to a junior researcher, and then I went for studies abroad. When I came back, I was appointed as HOD for Social Sciences Division, then Social Sciences, uh, Social uh, Science and Technology, and then I rose through the university to where I am, all the ranks. I've served in Senate since 2007 and from council to since 2016 was, uh, when I was appointed. Of course, I was interacting with council now and then as an advisor in the VC's office. I indicated earlier that I serve in bilateral commissions between Namibia and several countries, uh, and I am able to operate executive level both internationally and locally, and I will show some examples of that. I have expertise in grant writing, and I will show some examples of that, and I really, as I said, 
my view of management is that of leadership is that we need to transform people, not punish them. In terms of resources mobilized, I must say here that these are not resources that have only been mobilized by myself. I'll point out those that have been mobilized myself, but I believe in team leadership. And my office has been able to generate all these resources uh, that they in some of these we have managed to procure vehicles for the university and laboratory equipment. Uh, <laughs> masters, masters and PhD students have also been trained in this. One thing that I would like to point out perhaps is just two. Currently, uh, I'm leading a team that is doing the national uh, public sector innovation policy for the government of Namibia. Uh, and that is a task that is uh, very challenging. But I have also done other work for government in the conceptualization of the My Namibia, My Pride campaign. I wrote the concept. Well, then it was given to consultants for marketing. But <laughs> many of these, let me just point out that one of the skills I have learned in bilateral negotiations is through the work with KFW, the German government. You know that our engineering faculty has benefited and Katima will soon be benefiting as well uh, many millions of euros. When we go there to the bilateral commissions, you have to do pre-work, you have to network and engage ahead of time because many proposals go there. Uh, and the, 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 the write-up, the scientific work is done by our academics, but I do the politics. As VC, that's my job, to do the networking. I will speak a little bit later about the research and development campus that I have worked on as, uh, as well, which is being considered for funding by the, GEM, uh, the UK government. Now, the mandate of the University of Namibia, you all know it, I don't, I don't want to repeat it. My response to that, how do we link this mandate to national priorities of government? The first thing we need to ask ourselves as a higher education institution is, what is the purpose of the kind of education we train for? Is it for self-reliance? Is it for its own sake? Is it for the promotion of international competitiveness, for sustainability? And is it our job to develop character in the people we train? And when we answer these questions, we are able to link it to the national priority or priorities of government. But I want to point out that our enrollment must always keep in mind the National Human Resource Development Plan, which sits in the National Planning Commission. Otherwise, we have mismatch in terms of the skill sets that we need. <laughs> My role as VC, I know the, 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 the UNAM Act speaks to the VC as the chief academic and chief administrator. But my understanding is that modern higher education requires going beyond this role. Being an ambassador, being a networker, being a chief resource mobilizer, leading on strategy, mobilizing uh, resources, interacting, engaging with government, and ensuring that this institution is moving forward, keeping in mind the interests of the government and the commitments it has internationally. So what are the challenges? I believe that many of you know what the challenges of the institution are. We have quite good strength, and I'm not going to repeat them because we know them. I just want to point out there that one of our strengths is our asset base. We have $2.6 billion asset base, but we treat it as a liability. We have got to capitalize on this asset base. It's a strength that we have. We are also a major brand. We are brand international. When I was sitting in the international office, we were getting requests from other governments to give them quotas for student enrollments. Of course, because of infrastructure, we can't do that. But we are a brand that is there. Now, weaknesses, you know the challenges we have with our UMSs, uh, the, 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 the performance uh, management, the high workloads, the absence of uh, monitoring and evaluation, and the dependency on the state but also the incoherence between our academic programs uh, and planning. We, we approve a program in October, we make it start in September. Imagine the stress that comes with that. I want to stop that. 
In terms of opportunities, we have a very major opportunity. That is our own act. It's enabling us to borrow, lend, develop assets, invest, and so on. That act we have not utilized. But you know that since I came in the, in the, previous, in the research and innovation office, we now have uh, inceptors. And I'll speak to that in a moment. But we also have the opportunity, because we have moved into intensifying research and innovation, we have opportunities for alliance with the industry. Because we have prototypes that we can take to the market. It's not our job as an institution to really do the marketing, but we can channel it through inceptors and engage the industry. Because we've got to focus on our core mandate. R&D potential, the alumni network, for me, in my view, it's not a strength, it's an opportunity. Because they're out there, they serve as our ambassadors. In terms of threats, competition from our higher, other higher education institutions is going to increase, whether we like it or not, and we've got to prepare for that. Uh, the prevailing economic uh, climate in the country is also a challenge, uh, in that we may be graduating people who can't be employed, so we have got to be versatile and, and keep this in mind and train people for future jobs, not the current ones. Um, <laughs> Then the mismatch of the resources I've already indicated, and so on. Now, just to give you an example, because you may be, there has been this talk of government not uh, cutting budget, and so on, and so on. When you look at the data, you'll see that government has been supporting steadily this institution. From 1992, we started with 7.8 million in 92. It has been going up. The only thing that has been falling is that this growth in, in terms of the state's support to UNAM has not been matching our growth and our expansion. And the, this is a gap of engagement in my understanding. Uh, now look at the subvention. In terms of our expenses, just the, the four years of uh, audited statements, you can see that our our subsidy has been consistently lower than our expenses. Now, what do you do if you are a family person in your own life? You see that your expenses are going up, your income is low. What do you do? You begin to say, children, we are not going to have Wednesday dinners anymore. <laughs> we are not going to be going to a tosha. You start to cut to be able to meet to be realistic to live within your means but also you start to think about what businesses can i come up with so that i can bridge this gap and perhaps we haven't done that uh, then what are the, ex the majority of these expenses that seems to be high i want to just point to you um, the graph the salaries i'm sure uh, it has been uh, said uh, before the salaries are going up all the time. If you study UNESCO and World Bank reports, 70% of, of the total expense to going to salaries is okay because our business is human resource production. However, this must be in context. If you can't afford it, don't expand. So, we have to be careful in terms of how we come up with new programs because it will, uh, it will heighten this budget. Uh, it will co continue to increase the salaries and we have got to be. But the other reason why this salary is so high is because we are top heavy. If you count the number of uh, deputy directors up to the VC level, it's almost 60 or uh, 65, somewhere there. We are too heavy. And we have to look at this. But there are other expenses. Municipal expenses are also very high. We could invest in renewable energies to keep them low, lower. Uh, our maintenance budget is very high. But there is a cabinet resolution of 2007 that says but public ent entities can use vocational training and to, for maintenance purposes. And we have to tap into that. It gives them the opportunity also for skinning. Uh, security, my view is that we must invest more in uh, technologies. We pay 2.5 million per month 
for security for all our campuses. If we would invest more in technology, CCTV and others, and work smarter with the national police, we would cut this. Now, it, it, it is interesting, I think, that uh, we look at how do other universities function. The thing is, we have been stuck in that corner of state-sponsored uh, education. We have got to move beyond that and come to promoting entrepreneurship in the university. And my standing is going to be that for our core course, now we have this core curriculum which has HIV and so on, all of us know. But I would like to introduce entrepreneurship, sustainable development as core courses that everybody does. We have to move to sustainable development of the university and also train jobs for the future. What do I mean by that? Uh, in uh, mining, for example, or geology, we should not train them to just extract resources. We should train them to add value. In our transport engineering, we should be training them for the engineers that can operate bullet trains, not our old ones that we run here. Uh, Massification, I know this is another thing that has been uh, pressuring uh, the institution, we should just take students. For me, it, 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 it uh, affects quality, and we've got to be careful about that as well. Um, so what will I do? I must say here that I am not necessarily against our current vision, but my view is that as a university, everything we do now, we must set it up such that we are able to function as an international university. So my view is that we, my vision is to be an, a sustainable international hub of higher education training, research and innovation by 2030. You would know that our own vision currently doesn't have a timeline. So we wouldn't know when we have achieved it. Let me also say, let me also say that a vision can change, a vision and mission of an institution can change any time. What can't change is the mandate. Yeah. So, I, I have a plan. I have a plan of what I'm going to do. First thing is performance management. Why? Because we all need to know what the institution expects of us. And we have got to understand what is our role in it, what is the benefit that we get into it. So it will start with me, and it will come down. I, these are the action plans, there are seven of them. I'll talk to them uh, in each, uh, in a little bit more detail. But I just want to uh, uh, point out to you that I have categorized them in terms of administration and finance, in terms of uh, academic affairs or teaching and learning, and in terms of research and innovation. As I said, performance management, it will start with me. I know this has to be a consultative process between the, the unions, the teachers, and everybody else. But it is simple. We set targets together. We initiate commitment. We, we, measure, we, we set targets for measuring the progress. We link, the, we link it to consequences, good or bad and we review the effectiveness of the system. So I'm sure it's going to be easy, and it's going to target all those areas that I'm indicating there. We must not forget that this would be in the context of our strategic plan using the, uh, the balance scorecard as a tool for it. IT governance, in the university that I envision when I'm VC, these would be the standards. <laughs> these would be the standards I don't want rushed things. We introduce things when we are ready, when they are foolproof. In other words, they cannot be fooled or, uh, or, or hacked. I will not speak too much, but those are the standards. Now, the, in the context of where we are in the U UMS system, what do we do? What is worse? To implement a system that provides little or no value to UNAM? or to fail to implement an IT system that could have provided value to the, UNAM, to the university, but it is underdeveloped or poorly managed. 
It's a question I'm putting to you. Perhaps you will ask me what I will do. <laughs> well, let me answer you. My view is we are a quality-driven institution. We work on the basis of evidence. So an audit, if an audit says there are failures in the system and we can't proceed, we move that way. If it says we can correct this, then we do so. But it has to be an independent process, not based on subjective views. <laughs> Diversification of income. You already know we depend on the state and on tuition. Uh, it's 70% state, 20% tuition, no, no, 27% tuition, and 3% is coming from other sources. Now, there is a, uh, the, the question obviously is, where are we going to get other so resources? I'll speak a little bit more, but uh, there are many things we can do. I'm coming back to our asset base. In terms of Regulation 29 of the Pension Fund, institutions those pension fund uh, institutions that are running pension funds are required to invest in unlisted investments uh, about 11 percent and i think it is moving uh, up of their budget into education infrastructure and health yesterday there was an article in the newspaper in which gipf advertised uh, or informed people about the, uh, the fund managers that have allocated money, 5.4 billion. This money is there for us to engage. Our act allows us to do so. I must point out that although we have a, a, a pension fund, we are not allowed to do, but there are other mechanisms. The pension fund value in the whole country is about 220 billion. And all this money is there for investment, and we need to go there and get and engage. We have a challenge in terms of a collection of our tuition. At the moment, the university is owed about 500 million. We are unlikely to get that money in terms of the current uh, situation. Our revenue collection has been weak. I don't know how much, but it has not been efficient. And what I will do, I will securitize that student debt. What do I mean by that? I will sell it. There are people who have the appetite to sell that date, I mean to buy that date, it's 500 million, they can buy it for 450. The 50 million is their profit. The 45 they would collect from students. This is doable. I have already discussed this with some others. I also want to have, I want to have targets for the units that we have earmarked for income generation. I will not say which one, but I do know that at the moment, we are spending 4.5 million on salaries in one entity, but they are giving 700,000 income to the investing. Is it worth keeping that unit or not? I'm not saying we should uh, abolish it. I don't want anybody to lose a job, but I'm prepared to engage in terms of those assets and how we can assist to make them more efficient in terms of income generation. Now, we have established uh, this company, Inceptus, this is the value of what we can get out of Inceptus. I don't have much time to get into detail, but once implemented, we would be making 400 million income annually. We can already deal with the, the debt issue that we have and the gap in funding with this mechanism, especially if we get into uh, property development, asset management, and centers of excellence that would engage with the industry. The benefits to students and staff, we can build housing for students. Students can actually own shares in this company. In Finland, that is the model. Students run housing. You have a core funding of experts, but students come in to save them. So it has benefits. They are into, into uh, 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 they get opportunities for, ex for learning. Uh, internships and so on. And our staff, we could move also in terms of supporting them for housing, which is a crisis at the moment. <laughs> Stakeholder engagement, very important. We have to engage government, students, unions, everybody. The point of engagement is to capitalize on the endowments that this country has, using the priorities of the state. It's not engagement if we have one person sitting on a faculty board. 
That's not engagement. And I'll lead this. I, I am very keen in consultation to look into the administration system. As I indicated earlier, we are top heavy, whether in terms of academic or administration. I'm very interested in looking into how we can align this process without anybody losing a job. I have already analyzed how this can be done and we'll engage. I understand it's a process, but I'm ready to engage in this process. I'm also going to look into the efficiency of our committee system. Because, as you know, we have many delays in terms of decision making and so on. So I'm quite keen. Last on this uh, approach to capital projects, I want to take that away and give it to inceptors. The university's job is not to be investing in infrastructure. Inceptors will do that with the funds that I have indicated earlier. Other universities have done that. University of Toronto has a company that is even stock list listed. Finnish universities have such companies and there are many others where we can learn how this model works. Academic, I want managed enrollment so that at the, end, at the beginning of the year, we are not told just take the student. It must be clear from government for the next three years, this is the numbers that we can take, considering our infrastructure, our number of, of human resources, and so on. We will measure all these other things. Uh, our academic programs, I want them to be solid and sharp. We train specialists, not generalists. The university, the university must be known for something good. At least four or five areas, what we can say, in the world we can compete in these areas. At the moment, I don't think we can say we are best in Africa on this. So we have to link this into training, human resources, and so on. In terms of research, I'm drawing to a close. I have written a concept to the British government on the R&D campus. This campus will take PhDs that are looking at specific problems of the industry and public sector. That they are focusing on value addition only. The postdocs will be there, the industry will be there, and the industry will also have people who are working in this. It's going to cost about 30 million pounds the British government, Strategy International, and Commonwealth, we are engaging. I have met them twice, and we are going to meet again later this year. Um, other considerations, I believe it is important that we prepare for the future. The demographics are going to be different in 50 years. So the campuses that we have at the moment, we have to think about realigning them and, and prepare them giving them the status of university colleges. This is going to be a consultation process between government and council and the management of the university. But I believe we need to prepare them because they would play more effective role in regional development. Uh, I just want to say that leadership is different from management. Managers manage people and processes. Leaders lead strategy and they inspire others, and that's what I will be doing. <laughs> and uh, this is what the leader I will be. My job is to, to steer the vision, inspire people, uh, ensure that there's justice to transform the institution. I will be using our strength to complement our weaknesses, to compensate for our weaknesses, to maximize our opportunities, and to confront threats together. But we must all commit to personal growth to achieve this. <laughs> Lastly, some of my achievements recently, uh, last year I wrote another concept for the Chinese government. We have a commitment already for this, for this kind of building, which is going to, be, to house the list that I have given there. The point is this infrastructure is going to cut the infrastructure gap of the university by seven years. It's a five-story building with flats and so on and so on. And this is how it looks outside. Inside, we are going to have a multi-purpose hall that can take 4,000. We, we will now be holding our graduations on campus. And uh, as I conclude, let's, let's move from success to significance. And we do that by lifting others. And we can learn from nature.
even the termites help each other to get there. Because together each achieves more. It's hard work and we can do it. I thank you. Thank you. Yes, um, I will take it there are no questions I was a law student and I have an outstanding module so let's please give to her <laughs> <laughs> and, and you can't just get it huh? you must pass properly and we've heard uh, I think we are inspired um, three questions the first one is one, one question for Madin. Okay, let me ask one question. <laughs> Is a woman ready to lead? And if so, uh, or if not, what is your vision for changing the profile of management that has only one woman? And you keep talking about getting money from outside. What are you doing about getting money from within? Because outside has its own strings normally. Can you explain that to us? Shh, you'll get your chance. Thank you. No, the, the, the important one is, Kenneth, if you can also tell us, you keep talking about no one will lose a job, but how are you going to ensure that that does not happen? Okay. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Professor, for your wonderful presentation. Mr. Sifani, no, it's your boss, ne? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I've got one question for you. You said you lead with examples. Could you give us at least two best examples? Of what? Of, of leading. Yes. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much, Professor. I'm really enjoying your presentation. Today. Let's listen. So, Professor, uh, you have mentioned so many things, but I would like only confine myself to one question with regard to the IT. Uh, we are all in the world of a digital society or technology, and uh, now when you go to the other countries, like you mentioned in Finland, Estonia, there are people, you don't even see people uh, queuing either in the bank or even the the medical doctors they are just uh, having a prescribing. E, it's called e-prescribing. E-prescribing. School e-healthy, e-school, e-service, e-bank, e-ticket, and so and so forth. My question now is: Mic closer. Now, how do you help the university and the country at large to transform? from manual to digital society? For this round, we'll take four questions at a time. Just keep them short. Uh, thank you. I'm just tempted to ask. I shouldn't have asked. Um, thank you very much for your presentation, uh, BBC. The question is, uh, from your global networks, can you give us let's say programs, can be academic programs, uh, that you have benefited from, so that at least we may know at UNAM that we are likely to benefit from such. Thank you. It's over to you, Prof. Matengo. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, let me start with the last one. Uh, sometime last year, we began engaging uh, with uh, NetBank, and I chair that committee. You have seen that during our graduations uh, last year and this year, NetBank is there. They are sponsoring our graduation by 350,000. That's a benefit. I know that this is something that uh, can be improved and we are continuing. There's a portfolio that we are working on. Uh, so that is one example. The other is we signed an MOU with uh, uh, UNDP on the 
collection and provision of evidence on sustainable development goals. Part of that is for them to co-finance research chairs in specific areas that we will uh, develop. And we already held a conference with them jointly, and there will be another one, I, I know, a joint one with economics uh, and, and social sciences. So with those networks, we have been benefiting. But in addition to that, we have also signed an MOU with Namwater, in which our students in engineering faculty are already doing their masters on those projects. Uh, and and uh, uh, Namwater is committed also to supporting uh, research chairs. In terms of the E thing, when I said we must train for the jobs for the future, I meant that there are different revolutions that have taken place. We talk about industrial revolution. Maybe we are teaching for that level, but there is an IT revolution nowadays, and we need to be preparing, and that is the essence of that R&D campus. It will be focused on that. If you recall, uh, you will see here that um, there is IT logistics and big data. It's all about there. It is in there. I know the situation in uh, Estonia. I've been there. They even have what they call e-citizens. You can have citizenship of, uh, of Estonia while you are here. It allows you to do business. So this is my approach. And we need, in order for us to achieve that, we must consolidate high quality programs. We can't just expand. Uh, we have to have people who are dedicated, who are specialists in this. In terms of uh, leading by example, I think that was an academic ambush. <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, let me give an example of uh, in research, when I expect our academics to produce papers, I also task myself. I produce two to three papers a year, even though I'm very busy. But I do it because I'm saying others must do it. I'm expecting others, but I do it by example. When I bring in resources, <laughs> when I bring in grants, I plead to the principal investigators on those grants that let's not take the money into our pockets, those professional fees. Let's identify a master's or a PhD student that can benefit from that. We, we must empower others. It's our job to give others a chance. And I do so. I have two students at the moment that are, masters, uh, that are doing their masters that could have not done so if I had taken that money. In terms of uh, gender, whether a woman can lead, I think a woman can. Sorry? <laughs> it is not up to me to say whether a woman should take now or not. The, the most important thing, I think, for all of us is excellency. That should be the benchmark. But I see, but I see the value of that question in that I have looked at our student records. Although 64% of our UNAM student graduates are female, it's a good thing. But when you go to master's level and PhD, it dips. So we need to do something about that as well. And what I'm prepared to do is to make special scholarships in line with, and there are many bodies that are financing women to make those possibilities possible. But I think this is also a national issue. It requires us working with government to make legislation that allows families, that allows women to pursue their careers and still have families. <laughs> and, and as I said, SVC, it's my job to network at that level. In terms of your other part of the question, money from within we get money a lot from abroad and i think when we create a grants office we could get even more the challenge that this country has is we are not so much having that 
mentality of philanthropy. And again, this is engagement. Maybe the private sector doesn't know what we are capable of. They don't see value in us, but we have got to engage. There are other resources that we have obtained, obviously, locally, uh, from different agencies, uh, the, from the Prime Minister's office, from uh, Namdia, they just sponsored 650,000 for our development program. Uh, MVA has funded our Allied Health Sciences program, and so on and so on. There are several others, and I think the cracker in this is engagement. Did I leave? Uh, okay, I um, keep saying nobody will lose a job. I really don't want anybody to lose a job because I don't want to inflict pain on any family. I want all of us to come to the university happy and to go home happy. Not to be worried about home when we are at work and being worried about work when we are at home. <laughs> I don't want that. So, what I'm going to be looking at is best fit. If we, if we are able to get people where they are most skilled, we can crack this. And those of you who have analyzed, you would know that there are people who are the right people in the wrong places. We have got to put, put the right people in the right places. Okay. Thank you. There was, there was a question from uh, the Dean of Economics on specific, I think you said specific academic programs that you could say you have. From, I, from I other I, networks that you could say you have. I think I answered it. Did you? Okay. Yeah. Doc. Prof. I'm this side. Yes. A, a, very, a very good evening to you. Um, I'm pretty sure that um, you are aware that um, the conscious generation is actually delighted that we have two or it, there, there are two candidates as part of its own that are aspiring to take charge of the premier university. Now, in terms of Agenda 20, no, there are two candidates that are part of the don't, conscious generation. Don't, 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 don't. Okay. Now, in terms, in, terms of, um, in terms of Agenda 23, uh, Agenda, no, Agenda 2063. Uh, agenda 63. 2063. Yes, 2063. Yeah. The, the, in terms of its call for action, you know, and I think it's particularly in terms of Clause 72, the, the, it's calling for African state to, to catalyze to its educa their educational system. Let, let's move past the lecture to the question. I'm not lecturing, Chief. Also toward a radicalized um, local skill and revolutionized in, um, indigenous knowledge. Now, in the context of what you have delivered this afternoon, would you say that your package is it's aimed at making or positioning Namibia as a country with a, a revolutionized and radicalized educational system? Thank you. Okay. What I will now do is, that is the first question. Let me do something I have not done before. I will now give to those who have not asked any of the candidates any question. Because then they have not gotten any chance. Let me do that. If you have asked a question already, I would not give you the mic. Uh, Barbara? Thank you very much, Prof Matengu. I was very interested in your statement regarding the transformation of administrative sections into business units. I wonder if you could just elaborate on that. Thank you very much for the presentation, Prof. I want to know, you talk about the monitoring and evaluation system that is not so successful. 
what is your vision for improving this system? Thank you. Okay, I'm tempted to quickly give to Professor Kapama. Thank you very much, not, not Professor, please. Uh, so that you aspire. Uh, I, I, I will call you. No, thank you very much. Uh, you saw from the response from the audience that uh, they are truly inspired by uh, the Superman type of uh, uh, credentials presented and also the vision that seems flawless. Uh, and I'm just getting two impressions from that. The last four years you have been part of the UNA management. Is that leading to a question? No, no, it's, it, it, yes, it's leading to a oh, question. Okay, thank you. Uh, you have been part of the UNA management. And at UNA we have excellent but neglected infrastructure with dysfunctional technological support. Where have you been the last three years? And secondly, and one question. Uh, okay. Oh, the, a, a question comes after a full stop. Mine was a comma. Okay. Yes. Uh, now, uh, secondly, when I hear the good presentation, I have the impression that uh, Namibia is going to be left behind. Just one example. Specialized rather than generalized graduates in this market where the unemployment is so high. Will it really work? Okay, Prof, you may attend to those. It's already four. Let me let him respond to those and then we continue. Yeah, thank you. I again will start with the last one. You see, that is why I was talking about what is the purpose of education. What normally happens when a country is in recession, what normal, normally happens under normal circumstances, people lose jobs because their skills are no longer valued. I'm telling you, if you are going to lose your job, it's because your skill is no longer needed. And that is why it is important that we specialize and we reinvest in higher education because when you are in recession, you reskill the people and when they are reskilled, they come up with new ideas, new innovations, and that way you address the economic problem. The risk of massification, which I think you are saying, let's just take everybody in because otherwise they get left behind. Well, the result is they will be on the street with their certificates. We don't want that. UNAM is not the only institution that trains. We have to focus on what we are good at and work with others. For example, we started a, a dental program this year. Now, you all know that nobody in this country trains for dental hygienists or dental technologists or oral hygienists. The temptation is that we must start this program. My view is no. Let's talk to those institutions that are oriented to do these things. They can articulate. NAST, for example, is a technology and science innovation. They can do that level of technologists. We have to work together for the purpose of developing this country. The technicians can be trained with NTA. If the levels at NTA are low, we work with them. And by the way, we already have an, uh, an MOU with NTA. We work with them to make sure that the standards of which these people will be trained are still able to assist the industry. So my view really is that specialization is what is needed. People who are specialized, equipped with entrepreneurship and sustainable development, they will be able to do something about their, their situation. I have been part of UN, uh, UNAM management for the past four years, you said. True. Leadership is collective. 
You don't do and push things that you want only as an individual. Leadership is collective. You state your views, you put your argumentation. In the end, we have collective wisdom. What I am saying here maybe has not been possible for whatever reason, but I am very much aware of the challenges that we face, the challenges that we have been facing, and I believe we can turn this around. It's now the time to do so. Uh, monitoring and evaluation system. What are you monitoring? And what are you evaluating? We draw this from our strategic plan. It is complemented by a performance management system so that when we have a situation like I showed you on the slide where the income is lower than our expenses, with monitoring and evaluation, we pick it up quickly. And we start to do something. We don't say we are state-sponsored, government must do something, we fold our hands. Monitoring and evaluation is for that purpose, but it is also to enable us to, uh, to do skills audit to know where the gaps are and reskill our people. And so I see it functioning under this regime of performance management strategic planning which would be in my office. You know that at the moment we do our business reviews, it's for its own sake. We go there, we report to this Mbangu thing as we call it, <laughs> and we go back. Whether we have met the targets, it ends there. I will be sitting there making sure that when we are not meeting our targets, we do something. Well, if we need to train, we need to rescue, we need to scale down, maybe the targets were wrong or so. We move on those things and that is, I think, the purpose of uh, 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 monitoring and evaluation and strategic planning steered by the leadership. The question about the youth, it sounds to me that you may be more informed than me about that agenda because you quoted some article. What I know, <laughs> what I know, saving in the Association of, of uh, African Universities, you know that the Association of African Universities is linked to the Pan-African University, which is linked to the African Union. The vision uh, this Agenda 2063 is scaled down to those regimes. And how it works is Africa has been divided into five um, regions. And the one where we belong to, we have not agreed as SADC who should take lead. So what we have been doing as Namibia, I know, we are sending our students to Jomo Kenyatta University of Agriculture and Technology. You would know, and I negotiated this, you would know that they supported our first three cohorts of, of graduates for engineering. Their commitment was to come and support. So the Agenda 2063 scales down, yes, to the youth, but it is not to say the youth must now be radicalized. It is to say the youth must take responsibility. There must be the change that they want to see. And the universities prepare them for that by giving them the right kind of skills, uh, especially entrepreneurship and sustainable development. So this is what I, I and this is how I understand it. And I would be very keen to support this agenda. Thank you. Now for the last round. <laughs> Sir, you are on. A late good afternoon to everyone. Thank you, Prof. Uh, Matengu, for the presentation. I only have one question. Quoting from Prof. Lumumba, who says, those with power have no ideas, and those with ideas have no power. The university management system in terms of applications to UNAM, admissions, registrations, exams, graduation, 
and the rest. What are you going to do to address this crisis? I am speaking as a staff member and a PhD student at UNAM. Thank you. Let me see um, who has not had a chance. Yes, we have. It's the last round. We have four minutes. I checked. So I'm going to take only two, quest two more questions so that we are remaining within that time. How do I do this? Can I, anybody offer me a $50 or something? <laughs> okay. 60 Okay. Ma'am? Yes. You. With the glasses. Um, good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Lina, and I'm a student uh, here. Uh, my question is, uh, in your presentation, you mentioned um, weaknesses of UNAM. Now, my question is, is uh, safety of students on campus not a weakness? And if it is, what are you going to do to ensure that women students are not harassed by taxi drivers at the gate, that the windows are not smashed, and that the students in, in transit on campus are not mugged and robbed? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor. I believe if we are not convinced, we, are, we should be com uh, confused. Uh, but uh, in your presentation, a very good one, you have, you have been touched on corporate governance. I'm Philemon Jones. I'm focused more on corporate governance as a follower academics. The latest best practice in terms of corporate governance is to limit in terms of top executive positions. Key to that would be position of executive, uh, chief executive officers, the equivalent of which would be vice chancellor at the university. To, to be in line with the best corporate governance practice and to allow academics do what they are good and born to do. Teach, research, publish, and prosper. Would you consider introducing terms, term limits for all topic academic administrative positions at UNAM, including that vice chancellor position you are about to take? <laughs> Professor Matengo. You have less than two minutes to attend to this round, last round of questions. That's a challenge uh, for a talkative person like me. Um, let me say, uh, first, the issue of student safety. It's not um, a weakness. It's a risk. It's a risk. The, I said I have been a student here. I have served in the housing committee, in the student parliament, and so on. I understand your concerns, and I think they are genuine. They are there. And that is why I spoke about investing better in security. I said we are paying 2.5 million per month at the moment. But you are still afraid. So, since we are investing so much and you, are, you still feel insecure, it means we are not addressing your issue. And I'm very keen to discuss this issue. What are the students' own view of what kind of security system would best work for them? So that is, I think, how I would look at it. Uh, in terms of corporate governance, Performance management system, if it is introduced, it will definitely make sure that all the executives, and I will make sure, actually, there is already approved policy by council on performance management. We just have to enforce it. It is already approved. And what it will result in is exactly what you were saying. Term limits, I said three years ago, was it four years ago, uh, Mr. Reggie, if he's here, might correct me, in a committee that looked at this job level of assistant director, 
up to VC. And we propose in that committee that it must be limited. Five years. Sorry? And then they go. <laughs> well, you don't want to lose your best. This must be also managed carefully. Uh, but besides that, as part of good corporate government, what I'm going to do, it is in the slides, but I didn't talk about it. I think it is very important that we don't do what happens elsewhere. That when we have a, a high-performing lecturer, we promote them to be HOD. They perform better there, we promote them to deans. Who is suffering? They are high-performing teachers in the subject that they teach. So my view is we are misaligning resources if we are taking the best people into administration. Time, Prof. Time. Time. So I'm keen to discuss this and uh, see how we would move forward. But it is my view that all those who would be serving in administrative purposes, there will be a prerequisite. You take a, management, a development management course two years before the position is available. If you pass, you are eligible. Yeah. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, let me, on behalf of the search committee, thank you for having sat here for the last I do not know how many hours and for the very pointy questions you have had this will help the process I just want to reiterate what the uh, chairperson of the committee and council said that you will be hearing from UNAM within two weeks why, why within two weeks because we have been trying to explain the process of appointing the vice chancellor what the search committee will do is to make a recommendations to council and at a full meeting of council council will have to pronounce themselves on the recommendation they get from this search committee whether they accept or they don't accept that's up to council but again thank you and enjoy your evening UNAM is the best you want to, oh sorry you want to copy it? Who are you? Oh, okay. Did somebody lose their glasses? <laughs>